Hey CCF, welcome to Virtual Catalyst. Uh, just a little question for you all to get you engaged in the chat here. If you could resurrect one TV show to continue going, all the same main characters, everything's the same, you just want more of that TV show, what would it be? Go ahead and put it in the chat uh, as we're going through our announcements here. I'm interested to see what you guys have. Um, for me, it would be The Office. I would continue with Michael Scott, but I would still bring in Will Ferrell because he was like really weird and Robert California because I like the later seasons too. But The Office would be my pick. What is yours? I want to know. Um, so for our uh, announcements, we have just a couple things uh, that most of them you've already heard about, but a couple new ones. Uh, first, we still are planning on our November uh, bonfire, world's largest uh, CCF November bonfire ever. Uh, that is happening November 6th, and uh, don't miss it. Uh, it's going to be out at Shandy's. The pile for the bonfire has begun growing and growing and growing. There's like multiple couches and desks and um, lots of other things to burn, so it's going to be awesome. Uh, don't miss that. Uh, next thing we have is we are still uh, hoping to do the Audubon Trail cleanup. Um, if you're interested in doing that, it is this Saturday. Um, you could still sign up for that, or you could contact John Teeter. Um, the link will be in the reaction. Um, one other new thing for you guys is um, we have a little bit of a connection to a uh, Christian nutritionist uh, through, many of you know, Lindsay McNamee, um, who is now uh, L Lindsay Blanchard. And uh, she has uh, brought uh, us the ability to uh, join in on a uh, webinar that uh, this nutritionist is doing. Um, and the really cool thing that's kind of unique about this is it's not just a normal nutritionist webinar, but it's from a Christian perspective. Um, and she's going to be talking about things like even eating disorders and, and body image and how um, our spiritual relationship, how our relationship with God actually ties into things like nutrition. So that should be really cool. Um, it is next Thursday, so one week from today. Um, if you're interested, the link will be in the reaction and, and feel free to join in on that. Um, it sounds like it, it will be a pretty awesome resource. Uh, so with that, uh, please pray with me, and, and then we will enter into a time of worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now, and we thank you so much for the ability to um, worship you and the ability to uh, listen to your word. I pray that you would uh, make us uh, available and, and ready to, uh, to worship you, even though it is through, um, uh, through virtual. But, and then also, God, I pray that for our uh, for our speaker, and I pray that his words would be your words and that we would be open to um, your word and your message to us uh, through, uh, through your word and that we would be open to those things uh, tonight. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Chaos back into order 
who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy my 
medicine that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. Dying So if you guys have been in tune with the uh, cattle schedule, you'll know that we have another guest speaker tonight. And I was really hoping that he might be able to be with us in person, uh, but that's not where we're at right now. And so uh, he has sent us in a video and a video of his sermon. Uh, but I wanted to still introduce him like I normally would. And uh, so our speaker, our topic is the gospel and racial reconciliation. And our speaker, his name is John Michael Brown. And uh, the, the way I know him is he w used to be a uh, professor at my Bible college. And uh, it's actually the same Bible college that Shandy went to. And so we both know John Michael um, through that. And uh, the reason I picked John Michael Brown for this topic is because I've seen him speak on this topic. I've seen him live out this topic in uh, very effective ways. Uh, but more than that, I, I trust John Michael and I trust his um, his ability to look at scripture and find truth there. And that's what this whole sermon series is about. It's about taking these issues or these topics that we have in our culture and it's saying, okay, strip it all away and, and, and how do we approach it from the gospel? How do we approach it from the foundation of the gospel first and how does that dictate where we move out from there? And that's exactly what John Michael does. It's exactly what I've seen him do. And I know that that's what he'll bring for us here tonight. And so I'm really happy to have him here, even though it's not in person. Uh, but if you um, have any further questions or you'd like to talk to him, I know that he would be more than willing to, um, to engage with you all, uh, even if it was through email or something like that. And so get a hold of me if that's the case. Uh, but otherwise, uh, open your Bibles and enjoy. Greetings from Hall Spirit Christian Church in Blackjack, 
Missouri. It is a privilege to be with you guys uh, this evening, even though it's virtual there at the Christian uh, Campus Fellowship. And uh, it's just an honor and privilege uh, for me to come and to get to speak and to even see uh, Nathaniel as, as he is leading that ministry uh, there. I remember Nathaniel from college. Uh, he was one of two uh, Wonder Twins. You'll have to ask him about that, and you'll also have to ask him about his obsession uh, with gummy bears. But, but only his closest uh, students will probably get to hear about that. But uh, I really did feel like it was a great privilege and honor uh, to be asked to speak with you all. Um, I was given the topic today, the gospel and racial reconciliation. The gospel and racial reconciliation. I love that approach that you all have, the gospel and. What uh, effects, what impact does the gospel have in all of these areas uh, of our life? All the, the aspects, all the experiences that we go through that the gospel uh, should have some impact, should make a difference. But as I, I look at this text I want to share with you in Ephesians 2, I'm not sure that it's the gospel and racial reconciliation. The gospel is racial reconciliation. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 8, a familiar verse, but not everybody makes it through the rest of the chapter. It says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's, that's the gospel. But it says in verse 14, Therefore, because of what God has done through his grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the salvation that comes through him. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two a one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You see, I was, I was born into this, this conflict, this, this racial conflict that we see boiling over in our society. And, and right now, a little bit has kind of uh, settled down. We don't know how it's going to get after the election and, and what happens there. But I was born into this conflict. It takes me back to college. Not, not me in college, and there was plenty of conflict when I was in college, but when my parents were in college. My father is a very dark-skinned man from southern Alabama, from the deep south. My mother is a very fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman from Michigan. So from these polar opposites of the United States, these two got together at Hope University. And 
strangely enough, what had happened was they got together, like got together, and my mother became pregnant. And my grandfather insisted that they take the life of my older brother. When my mother refused to do that, he refused to speak to her for at least five or six years. I didn't know this as a child, but when we went to visit, my grandfather would leave town and go stay in a hotel. He wanted nothing to do, not because my father's a, not the greatest and most moral of people, but rather simply because of his race. And that's what I was born into, a conflict. But yet, the word of God says that at the cross, God was not just reconciling man to himself, but he was reconciling man to man. You see, in this text, we have a war in perspective. You see, the war between Jew and Gentile was something that was in, in many ways established by God. You see, God had to set apart the Jews to establish what holiness and righteousness was. Not that the Jewish people were holy and righteous, but he established a separation that reflected the very separation that was between God and man when they sinned. You see, that, that conflict between Jew and Gentile, you may realize this, that Jesus had to be killed by the Romans because the Jews did not have the, the authority under Roman rule for capital punishment, with one exception. And that exception was when a Gentile went past the wall that was only for the Jews. They could kill a Gentile. And, and it was found in an archaeological excavation. It was found that, that there was a sign that was up there that, that read something like this. Any Gentile found beyond this point will be responsible for his own death immediately to follow. You see, the Jew-Gentile conflict was, was such a great conflict and it had this religious overtone. And the Jews, even though they were oppressed, the Jews looked down on everyone else. There was this, this war in perspective. Secondly, there, there was a way, a way into peace. And that way into peace was Jesus Christ himself. It says that he broke down the dividing wall. You remember when Jesus was crucified, when he died on the cross, that the temple veil, that veil that separated God and man, that, that, that veil that separated them from going into the Holy of Holies where God's presence was, was torn from top to bottom. But you see, that same thing at that same moment when Jesus Christ was dying on the cross, he was making a way into peace. This conflict, this war that was taking place, this war that still takes place between men, we can find peace at the cross. That is our way. That is the only way. The, the scriptures say that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Remember, we're told there is no, no Greek, no Jew, no slave, no free, no male, no female in Jesus Christ. You see, in him, we can have peace. The war can be over. But the truth of the matter is, is that, that this whole process, the reality, it just says when we accept Christ and his blood covers us, we are saved. We are, we are justified. We have our salvation, but there is that, that work in progress, and that is sanctification. You see, the reality is, is that even though Jesus Christ died for our sins and saved us, we still work on our sanctification. We work on our holiness. And even though God destroyed the dividing wall between men, this, this war that goes on, this tension that, that seems to, to, to keep going and going and going, just when we think we're past it, it, it rears its ugly head again. This, this racial tension uh, comes back. But see, if we're going to work through it, if we're going to get to the place that God has already established, we are one in Christ. We have to, to be intentional about it. What's interesting, we, uh, we had this when, when uh, I was teaching at Bible college and when I was in Bible college myself. Um, there, there's this re reality, there's a tension in the scripture. See, we like to take a lot of passages of scripture and we like to apply them to ourselves. If it says it in the scripture, we like to apply it to ourselves. Now, 
Many of these principles do apply to us, but we have to, to look at the scriptures and actually determine whether or not the promise or the text was referring to all believers or if it was just referring to the, the hearers, the listeners. A lot of times what we read in scripture is, is applied to specific individuals, oftentimes the apostles in the New Testament. But there is a passage of scripture. It's in the Gospel of John, John chapter 17. You may be familiar with this passage of Scripture. This is the moment in time many scholars refer to this as Jesus' prayer, the Lord's prayer, the true Lord's prayer. Not the model prayer, our Father who art in heaven, but the true Lord's prayer, the prayer that Jesus prays the night that he goes to the cross. And did you know that at that moment he was praying for you and praying for me? In John 17, verse 20, it says this, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. There could not be any other time that speaks directly to us than this passage. Jesus is praying not only for his disciples, but for everyone who will believe in him because of their message. We believe because of the message. We believe because of their testimony. And what did Jesus pray? He prayed that all of them may be one, Father. Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. You have loved them even as you have loved me. That's what Jesus' prayer was. Jesus prayed for unity. He prayed that the world would see in the believers a unity that transcends human understanding and that unity comes from the cross. It comes from the gospel that every man has sinned, but God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die. And when we realize each and every one of us is in the same boat, dead in our sins, but saved by the gospel, the blood of Jesus Christ, we begin to see people differently. We begin to respond to one another differently. You see, this unity Jesus prayed for, it was very, it was very uh, frustrating and it was very discouraging. When I was in Bible college and I took a cl class on the restoration movement is, and the pillars of the restoration movement, the independent Christian churches and churches of Christ, two pillars that they were built on was the authority of scripture and the unity of all believers. When I took a class in the history of that movement, we, were, we had a discussion board. This was long before Zoom. This was like this new thing where you're, you're doing classes online. This is, when, this is way, way, way back when. And, and I'm in this class and the discussion board, is unity really possible? And it was amazing to me that these were individuals that were going to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were going to be the ministers, the campus uh, uh, ministers, the church ministers, the youth ministers, the missionaries. And, and so few of them believed that unity could really happen. Why was I so discouraged? Because it's what Jesus prayed for. Why would Jesus pray for an impossibility? God wants us to live in the reality of the reconciliation that comes from the gospel. The reconciliation that is the gospel. That every sinner, each and every one of us who falls short of the glory of God, we're all in the same boat. And we all have to come to the cross for our salvation. I remember someone once saying that the, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. We're all on the same spot. We're all at the same starting point. We're all sinners and we need Jesus. You see, this unity though, 
It's not, it's not easy for us to see a visible unity. It's not easy for us to get believers from different backgrounds, from different viewpoints, from different circumstances, from different socioeconomic classes, to get them together so that the world could see that Jesus makes a difference. I wonder how much Jesus has made a difference in our current conflict. When we see that, that this, this division, this divisiveness, especially, especially during election time, has found its way in the church. It's not supposed to be there because of the cross. It doesn't happen by accident. Salvation for humanity didn't happen by accident. It was intentional. In James chapter 1, you know, James is, is talking about the man that, that hears the word of God and does nothing about it. He, he's like the man that, that looks at himself in the mirror and turns around and forgets what he looks like. Who does that? I mean, I mean, think about it. Have you ever gotten to the mirror and realized that you had a little booger in there? Have you ever, how many people saw that book? But, but how many of us, now that we see the booger in our nose, just walk away and forget that it's there? Nobody. Well, maybe except that the one that sits back there in the back. That's why they can't get a date, because they're always, I don't know. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? that we are supposed to look at God's word and we are supposed to be intentional. Because God says that the unity that's supposed to be visible in the church will tell the world that God is real and the gospel is true. If God cannot bring man together, how can he save us? If the gospel doesn't make the difference between two human beings, how can the gospel overcome sin? We have to be intentional. I want to give you a, a few principles that I take from Scripture that, are, that I, I, I see in Scripture. And I, I want to take these principles from two individuals that we all respect. And the two individuals are Peter and Paul. I, I want to tell you about intentionality, and I want to take these principles from their lives. Let's start with Peter. In John chapter 4, you remember in John chapter 4, the, the scripture tells us that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Did he really? You see, they had different routes. But see, this was the thing, that Jesus, when he went through Samaria, he crossed every socioeconomic barrier that they had in the day. Remember it. Remember it in chapter 4, the, the disciples go to town to get some food and stuff. And so Jesus, what he does is he's sitting there at the well. And there's a woman, and he, and he begins to speak to this Samaritan woman. What are you doing, she said. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you talking to me? We don't, we don't even use the same cups. We don't even drink after each other. It kind of reminds me of how we used to be in this country. We had our different water fountains. Not only that, when Jesus tells her who, who he is and, and says that you would ask me for a drink, she's like, who are you? Are you somebody? And we look at, at, at our society and we know that people with power and money make all the decisions. Are you, are you like that? And Jesus crosses that barrier. And, and, and then, and then this, this, this change uh, uh, takes place because ultimately uh, she, she's like, oh, I need this water. And, and she realizes it's different. And what happens is, is that she, she wants to know about the water that he has. And he says, go get your husband. And what we find out is that her life is a little bit tainted. That sin barrier that we look at people in that way. And not only that, their religion, their faith. She said, she said you guys worship on that mountain and we, we worship on this mountain. All these socioeconomic barriers, Jesus intentionally crosses those so that she could meet the Messiah. And the only one that is keeping these barriers up between people are people like you and me. It's followers of Jesus Christ who should know better because we're washed in the blood of the Lamb. We know that, that in Christ Jesus there is, there is reconciliation, but we have to be intentional about crossing those social barriers. Not only that, we see in Peter's life in Acts chapter 10, Peter is, is hungry, he's up, he's up on the roof. He goes up on the roof, he's waiting for them to cook, and, and he goes into a trance. Maybe you know what that's like. 
so hungry that you go into a trance. And he's up there and, and he sees this vision and heaven is opened up and this sheet comes down. It, makes, it reminds me of being at my, my home when, when my wife is being uh, real hospitable. She has the gift of hospitality and she serves people. And, and Nathaniel can tell you about her, her peanut butter cookies with chocolate chips. He used to come to my house on Sunday nights and we used to play these board games and stuff called Heroscape. I used to do one. Um, yeah, he probably don't want you to know about that, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I used, I used to always win. Him and his wonder twin used to tag team and try to beat me, but I still won. Uh, but that, that's by the grace of God because I'm really not that good. It was all just a roll of the dice. But she put those cookies and she laid that food and Peter's up there and he's hungry. He smells the food being cooked and, and what happens is he's told to kill and eat. But the animals he sees are all these unclean animals and he's like, I've never eaten anything like that. No, I can't eat that. And it says he went through this three times. Did he not figure that out when he was denying Jesus three times? That you might want to listen to these heavenly beings. And so he had to, to figure out that, oh, oh, God is not talking about the food when he says that I've made all things clean. He's not talking about the food and the animals. He's talking about people. And so, oh, Peter gets it. But that wasn't enough. He intentionally had to get out of his comfort zone because at the same time he's realizing this, the same time God is revealing this to him, there are people from Cornelius' house. He's a centurion. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman. He's one of the bad guys. And Peter, it wasn't enough for him to sit on the roof and acknowledge theoretically that all people are clean. He had to get out of his comfort zone. And he had to travel to Cornelius' house. And if you read the rest of the story, you know that the Holy Spirit shows up and he recognizes that God has come to the Gentiles. But Peter didn't always get it. It's strange to me that in that life, he had experienced all these things. We get to Galatians 2. In Galatians 2, we find out the situation. It's Paul that writes Galatians and he references Peter in Galatians 2. You see, what happened was is that Peter was hanging out with Gentiles until the Jews came around. And when the Jews came around, what he did, he preferred to sit and to eat with the Jews. You see, if we're going to be intentional about letting the world see the gospel played out through racial reconciliation, we have to be intentional about giving up our personal preferences. You see, the gospel is for everyone, and we should be willing to associate with everyone, and we should demonstrate that God loves and calls everyone into his fellowship, and the people of God love and call everyone into fellowship. We have to intentionally cross those social barriers, and we have to intentionally get out of our comfort zone. You know, I get so sick of people talking about what needs to change in society and all these people that will stand on TV and tell you what needs to change are not putting their children in inner city schools. They're not moving to neighborhoods where people are being shot in the street. They stand in their places of comfort and they tell everyone else what they need to do. But Christians, we are willing to get out of our comfort zone. And not only that, we're willing to give up our personal preferences to show the unity of the body of believers. But you see, that was Peter's failure in that moment. And so in Galatians 2, we actually see Paul's first principle. And the principle from Paul is this, is that because Peter had done that publicly, Paul confronted him publicly. You see, we have to be intentional about confronting sin. We have to be intentional about confronting anything that is against the unity of God. The truth of God, we need to confront these things. And we do it intentionally. And we do it to the extent that it's taken place. If people are sinning and speaking publicly wrong against the truth of God, against the unity that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ, you and I need to confront it publicly. So in Paul's life, he did that. He confronted Jesus, his right-hand man. Peter had the keys of the kingdom, and he made mistakes. And you know what? We're going to make mistakes. But when we do, we can be confronted, we can confess, and we can repent, and we can turn from those ways. Another thing 
that Paul does, another principle that we can get from Paul, is when in 1 Corinthians 9, if you remember, he says, I become all things to all men that I might win some. He also even says in, in chapter 10, I, I try to please all in all things. I try to please everyone. Not in the sense that we're trying to make friends in a worldly sense. Not in a way because we want to give people what they want. Not in a way because we want to be walked over. But we have to intentionally learn to relate. If I'm going to go to another country, if I want to take the gospel to another country in an effective manner, I have to get to know the people group that I'm reaching out to. I have to know the people. And so what we need to think about is intentionally becoming like other people and being able to relate. I remember in this very building, when I first became the youth minister, there was a young man, and uh, he's really into heavy metal. And, and I think, if I remember correctly, he had asked me about Metallica. And I couldn't think of a whole lot of stuff, but, but I tried to kind of remember some, and then I started asking him about it. And just showing an interest. And that made quite a difference in his life. Later on, I actually um, went, took him through his marriage counseling and performed his wedding. But I just remember the impact that it had of me trying to relate to him. And how many people out there are there that you could do a better job relating to? I don't care where you're from. I don't care what your experiences are. You have to do your best to intentionally relate, because if you can't relate, you can't have relationship. If you don't have relationship, you have no avenue to share the gospel. It's kind of funny, my first ministry, my first uh, uh, vocational ministry that I was in, I was in Bible college, and I was in this town in Oklahoma. I'm from Oklahoma, I actually spent most of my life in Oklahoma, but I, I was at this church. When I went to the town, I was literally the black population. It was a farming town and people, you know, I, I didn't know anything about that. I had lived on a farm for a little bit when I was a kid because we got kicked out of the, the house that we were renting at the time. But, but I, I didn't know anything about this, but I know this much. That I can be like Jesus and I can try to humble myself and put others first so that I can build relationships so that God might minister through me and the gospel might become a reality. It didn't matter. It didn't matter when we begin to love and care about people. We have the purpose of seeing them come to know the gospel in a saving way. We're willing to take the time to get to know them and to build relationships. We have to intentionally become all things to all men, not for the purpose of letting them live however they want. Because Paul even said it, to the lawless he becomes like one not under the law, although he's under Christ's law. To a Jew, he's like a Jew. To a Gentile, he's like a Gentile. You have to learn to relate. We can't sit back and say, oh, I don't like that kind of music. Oh, that's stupid. Oh, I don't. That's not building relationships. That's not becoming all things to all men. And Christ calls us to do that very thing. And Paul shares the principle with us in 1 Corinthians. In, in Romans chapter 12, he gives us our final principle that I want to share with you. So, so remember, we want to intentionally cross those social barriers. We want to intentionally get out of our comfort zone if we're going to see this visible unity. We, we need to intentionally give up our own personal preferences. We also need to be willing to confront wrong when we see anything that's against the truth of the gospel. We need to intentionally be, become sensitive and begin to relate to other people so that we have an avenue to share the gospel. But finally, what we need to do is we need to be intentionally inclusive. Remember in Romans 12, he begins to talk about there's, there's one spirit there's one spirit, but, but there's, there's one body, and there, all of us are many parts. And I love how in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he ends up going in more detail about the inclusiveness of the body of the Christ. One body, many parts. And what he says there, he talks about the foot and, and the hand, and, and the foot can't say that he's not important because he's not, he's not a hand. They're both important. What would it look like if a body walking around that, that had no hands, no feet, no, you, you know, if, if it was just a hand? Or it was just a foot or just an eyeball rolling down the street. 
It also says the eye can't say to the hand, you're no good because you're not an eye. So it's on both ends. Everybody has a place in the body of Christ. Everyone has value and we have to be intentionally inclusive in our circles. Let me tell you something. I just went to a wedding not that long ago. I just went to a wedding. And there were only two people. Even though it's COVID, there were only two people. I know that, that there were fewer people than normally would be at the wedding. But I'm telling you, it just reminded me. There were only two people, myself and one other person, that was permanently tanned. That's my politically correct uh, phrase, permanently tanned minority Americans. But I, wanna, I want you to think about something. I, I want you to think about how many weddings that you've gone to that were not racially diverse. How many funerals have you gone to that were not racially diverse? You can see in a person's life, those are the moments where you see what is important to them, who is important to them. And too often we Christians have weddings and funerals where you can't visibly see the gospel played out through racial reconciliation. We have to be intentional. It's not gonna happen by accident. And as you can see all around the world, at every opportunity, Satan rears his ugly head and stokes the fires of racial tension. There are people that profit off of racial tension. And where are we as the church? The gospel and racial reconciliation? No, the gospel is racial reconciliation because in Jesus Christ, there's only one. Sinners who have been washed in the blood of the lamb and your skin color, your race, your gender, your socioeconomic class, none of these things matter in Christ. I told you, I was born into this conflict. But God is greater than us. It was a few years back, that oldest brother had his first wedding. It was actually in October, if I remember correctly. He had his, it was his third marriage, but it was his first of wedding. And, and what he wanted was as many of his family members that would be there, and, and so we have seven of us. There's, uh, I have three brothers and three sisters, and we have four different moms, and, and, and there's a lot of hot mess in our family. But I remember we were staying at this hotel in Pittsburgh, and I remember I was born into this conflict. My grandfather, my mom's father, would not talk to her because of her relationship with black men. He would leave town. He wanted nothing to do because of his race. Textbook racism acted out. But I remember we were all the family members were staying in this hotel. And I came down and you know you have the, that's the hotel you want where they had the continental breakfast. And we went down into the, you know, to the lobby there where they had the table set up and they had the continental breakfast. And there at a table, having coffee together, was my father. And the truth is, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how the tension and the division and the hate and the hurt and the pain went away. But the truth is, I don't know how God did it either. It's just the power of the gospel to bring about racial reconciliation. to destroy every barrier, not only between man and man, but between God and man. The gospel is racial reconciliation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the fact that you loved us and you knew that we weren't worthy but you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die. While we were powerless, while we were your enemies, 
and you surrendered his life at the cross. And Father God, as we surrender each and every one of our lives daily at the cross, I pray that we can be committed to the reality that at the feet of Jesus, showered in the blood of the Lamb, each and every one of us is reconciled to one another. But most of all, because of the blood of Jesus, we're reconciled to you and can enter into your eternity, can enter into your glory. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you.